The Road to Autonomy is presented by the Road to Autonomy Index. The Road to Autonomy Index is a rules-based equity benchmark index that measures the performance of a basket of global companies that are involved in the development and commercialization of autonomy. Institutional investors and fund managers are watching megatrends that are shaping investment opportunities today. These megatrends are creating thematic investment ideas and opportunities for forward-thinking investors. We believe that one of the biggest megatrends today is autonomy. That's why we created the Road to Autonomy Index, the world's first and only pure play index to track the thematic investment opportunity in autonomy. Follow the Road to Autonomy Index on your favorite finance app by simply typing in the ticker autonomy. To learn more about the Road to Autonomy Index, visit roadtoautonomy.com forward slash index. Hello and welcome to the Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome Sam Abadie, Chief Commercial Officer, Monarch Tractor. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be on. It's great to have you here because autonomy is good for farmers, autonomy is good for the farm, and most importantly, autonomy is good for the economy. Monarch's developing autonomous tractors. They're doing a lot of good for farms and and farmers and the economy. So, Sam, how is Monarch Tractor approaching autonomy? Yeah, no, Grace, I think our big thing when we looked at this all the way back in 2018 when we got started was if you can't do it cost effectively, it won't be adopted and you won't have a chance to make a big difference. And so um, from day one, we were thinking about how can you build an autonomy kit that can go onto a tractor that can essentially reach a price point that most farmers can use. And where we landed was you needed to do a bottom-up build of the tractor. That tractor is called the Mark V. We've spent the last six years developing it. And from an autonomy perspective, instead of taking the typical on-road autonomy kit that has LiDAR and radar and cameras and does all the fusion layers, we took a more simplified approach uh, because the limited operating design domain of agriculture allows that. And we built a system that is focused mostly around a camera with support from GPS. Uh, And then we used unique software to enable a system like that to run on a farm every day. Uh, Last six years, we've been honing this. And today, these tractors are running on camera primarily as their uh, sensor input on farms all around uh, California and slowly expanding their way across the U.S. Uh, And I think that the ability for these kinds of technologies to get adopted is based largely on the price point at which people can buy them. So that was kind of our hypothesis on day one, and it's uh, it's proving uh, proving to be true now. What is the price point that's enticing farmers to say, okay, Sam, I want autonomy on my farm? Yeah. So, so if you look at our Mark V, it's about a $90,000 tractor. But if you start to zoom out and you think about the labor cost for a tractor, so a tractor can last sometimes eight years. Tractor drivers making about $30 an hour, and they run these tractors about 1,000 hours a year. So that's almost a quarter of a million dollars of cost that they incur for that tractor over its lifetime in labor. And we don't you know, pretend to be replacing all of that, but you start to be able to automate 50% of that, 75% of it. Uh, you're talking about a meaningful savings for a farmer who runs an operation on a pretty tight budget today. Uh, it starts to make the cost of the underlying tractor really a fraction of the value proposition that the farmer is thinking about when they're thinking about adopting autonomy. Look at the economy, a global economy. I study that a lot, but let's look at the U.S. economy. Bank of America has been publishing a lot of really good data lately. They're calling it a labor light economy, and there's a lot of data in your industry, in agriculture, where there's a labor shortage on farms. With the with the labor shortage, a ninety thousand dollar price point, which I think is frankly a, a steal. It's a discount. Are you seeing a big growth curve, a big adoption of the farmers saying, "Wait a second, there's a really economical way for me to make up for the labor shortage." Yeah. So someone like me, I line out the business case real quick. But if you actually go talk to some of our farmers, many of them are coming to us because it is an alternative to having no one do that job. Today, farmers optimize how they run their their various operations, whether it's seeding or tilling or spraying around the labor they have available. They will use different chemicals because those chemicals require less passes through the uh, farm because they don't have the labor to support the higher pass variant, which might be more sustainable, for example. And so we're really giving them the opportunity to optimize a better equation, an equation where the movement of the tractor is no longer a constraint because you're eliminating the current labor constraint. And then they get to choose the best way to run their farm, 
Um, so that ends up being actually a big selling point for farmers, uh, more so than you know the typical bean counters assessment of what is the savings in this year versus what I pay up front. Farmers or economists at heart, they, they know what, what the cost of grain is, what the cost of a bundle is. They know all that. So when you're having this economic conversation with a farmer around autonomy, is it are you coming there with a breast of fresh air? It's like, oh, he's not another salesperson. He's somebody that actually understands the economics of how to run and operate a farm? Yeah, I think uh, an, an interesting fact about Monarch, so one of our you know core values, we call it farmer frugal. And it's because we're cognizant that it's a dollar first business for farming because the margins are so tight. Uh, and so we embody that in the way that we run our business and therefore in the way that we present ourselves to our customers. And I, I think it does earn us a lot of respect that we're not just coming in with some shiny new technology that works, but you know we ignore what it costs and when and if they'll ever get a payback. And instead, we approach it 100% uh, from the angle of you, the farmer, make CapEx investment decisions every year. And the fact that you're still around means that you've been making them well. Here's the data we have. Let's plug this into the way that you think about your operations and let's figure out what the value that this will create for you over the next couple of years is. Uh, and we spend a lot of time with the, uh, the farmers that we work with running those models. And they're sophisticated. Like you said, uh, a lot of the farms that we, we work with, a lot of vineyards are very large operations, 100 plus tractors, large P&Ls, very thoughtful CapEx purchasing decisions. Uh, and we spent a lot of time with them helping them understand how, yes, this is a more expensive tractor up front, but as all CapEx investments, you see a return in the OPEX decrease. And so we, have, we, we spent a lot of time having that conversation with some really smart farmers who've actually helped us hone our own argument over the years. Farmers are brilliant people. I use the term, I use the kid's term, yummy tummies. They, they, they allow us to have yummy tummies with healthy fruits and vegetables. There's no, no way around that. So you have a farmer that has a, a large operation, thousands, thousands of acres, and say, okay, Sam, we understand the CapEx. We, we can amortize it over X a period of time. But then you have the farmer says, wait a second, I can't necessarily afford the CapEx, but I can afford it as a service. Are you looking at running Monarch potentially as a service at some point for that farmer where you come in, you do the tillage, or you can do the seeding, and, as, and they just pay you per acre or however you can do your business model? Yeah. So maybe I can explain our business model today and then talk a little bit about where as a service might fit in, in in the long term. So today we sell to the to the farmer like they buy. Today they go buy a tractor at MSRP and we, we do the same thing. Once they buy that tractor, we charge them essentially a monthly subscription to unlock autonomy. We charge $5.99 a month for autonomy and then we charge $1.99 a month on top of that uh, for what we call connect, essentially the ability to connect that autonomous tractor to the command center. And so they're, they're all in for 800 bucks a month uh, to essentially have this, this autonomous capable tractor. That has been the model that we've used because it lines up with the way that they do their financing. And these are large organizations. And so their staff, one, they have the capital to make CapEx investments. And then two, their staff can, over time, be trained to operate these tractors. And that's exactly what we do with them over a handful of weeks. In time, if we move to non-commercial farming, smaller farms, or even into international markets, you could see a world where a lease model uh, starts to make more sense for those markets. I, I know in some of Asia Pacific, this is how uh, tractors are sometimes used, more on a you know by the hour model because uh, there are not CapEx investments being made in those farming markets. We've you know weighed the pro-cons of these and we have a model today, but we're definitely flexible, especially as we think about international expansion uh, of needing to use different models in different geographies. It goes back to banks have a KYC, know, know your customer, or you can do KYR, know, know your region. There's different cultures and customs. So let's say you're looking at a region in Asia or you're looking at a region in Europe, for example, and they prefer to pay it forward as a service. Do you hold that tractor on your balance sheet or, or do you offload to a partner such as a CNH in, uh, Industrial Capital America where you're, you're not holding that asset on your balance sheet? How are you going to approach the balance sheet aspect of it? Yeah. So today uh, it comes, obviously it's not on our balance sheet because the, the customer is purchasing it. The deal that you're referencing that we've done with Case New Holland is one where they've helped set up financing so that when customers purchase our tractors, they can finance it, much like you and I would finance a vehicle if we went and you know, bought an F-150. But it does help one understand how in the future you could imagine a third party financing a huge fleet of tractors under like a lease model uh, so that end customers, farmers on small farms, uh, could essentially use it by hour 
and it wouldn't affect our balance sheet. You would you would definitely see us look to partner in that way in the long term if we went into a leasing model because it's a, it's not an effective use of capital for for us to be essentially holding a, a bunch of tractors. Okay, I'm liking your model here. So you you have the partnership with CNHI for the financing. Did, did that unlock growth where that farmer can go get financing from them to deploy? say 10 tractors, 20 tractors, five tractors, depending on the size of their farm, does that really unlock another growth mechanism for you? Yeah, I think financing is an important part of, of farm economics. Today, a lot of uh, larger vehicles are, are mostly financed by farmers. For us, we're, we're kind of in the early innings of getting our tractor out to a bunch of customers who are kind of on the bleeding edge of things and we're moving into the main body of the farming user base. I think as we, start, as we continue to penetrate into that main body, financing is going to be more and more important. You're probably familiar with this, but there's all sorts of innovative financing models for the electric world, like battery as a service. And and you see a lot of off-road companies starting to uh, play with these. And I I think some of them have a lot of merit. So on our side, we're we're exploring all of them. But anything you can do to help uh, farmers essentially handle the difference in price between a diesel tractor and an electric tractor to smooth that out for them is always going to help adoption. Yeah, because there, I mean, you see you know, your backgrounds in trucks, and if you're sitting there with, say, Acme Carrier or Acme Fleet, you it's you're very hard pressed say, to make it well, why you need a, an electric eighteen wheeler versus a diesel eighteen wheeler. You, you just can't you just can't do it. But on the farm, you can easily make that because I, I want to hi- highlight. So I'm let's say I'm farmer I'm farmer Grayson, and I, I'm out on my farm, and I, I'm away from the shed, and I'm doing what I'm doing. Can I tap into my tractor for power for, for welding or if I need a light? Can I tap into it as a, as a source of energy? Yes. So we often will refer to this as an energy transformation device that happens to look like a tractor. Today, if you look at a farmer taking their diesel tractor out, they'll very likely uh, have a gen set, like a generator. On the back of it, if they're going out to the field to do, for example, a weld or to run a pump, or to put up some lights to watch, uh, for example, if they're harvesting at night, and then you just hear that generator humming, it's burning diesel back there. We saw that use case uh, during our early development, and we said, there's an incredibly simple opportunity to draw power off of this 100 kilowatt hour battery that we have. And so we created uh, essentially plugs on the tractor uh, that are high voltage plugs that allow you to run pretty meaningful machinery. Uh, You you can run a sizable welder, you can run uh, some pretty, uh, high intensity lights to cover a large area for farming. These are all use cases that that happen today, but they require you to carry a generator, burn diesel, and we're essentially transforming all of those operations to electric and increasing the ease with which they can be initiated. It's a multi-use tractor. So I'll ask you this: Are you the Swiss Army knife of tractors? <laughs> yeah, there 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 are a lot of uh, a lot of similarities between the Swiss Army knife. I'm going to try to carry your analogy here, but one big one that's just obvious. Our tractor has a swappable battery. That's not very common. You know, listeners who have an electric vehicle, they do not have a swappable battery. Uh, But farmers need to be able to run uh, at some peak parts of the season, 24-7 or or near it. And uh, it doesn't make sense to put a battery on there that can run around the clock. And so what we ended up doing is we have a battery that runs about 14 hours. And the farmer can actually pull that out with a, a swap cart and put in a new battery. And they can start running the next shift. And this allows them to ensure that they're getting the same utilization during those critical times of the season as they would out of a out of a diesel tractor. Um, so you know you've got the swappable battery, you've got power that you can take off the tractor, you've got the autonomy kit on on top, and between those couple of of features, you could you could call it a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> I like that. Does the farmer subscribe to the battery, or they just say, "Okay, Sam, we're going to buy the tractor for ninety thousand dollars, and now we're going to." Here we go. It's a famous add-on department. Let's let's add on <laughs> batteries. Is, is that what it's like? So today, when you buy a tractor, that $90,000 I was citing earlier, that, that gets you a tractor with the battery. It's got battery, it's got propulsion, it's got a seat, it's got the autonomy kit, it's got everything that we've, we've been talking about. What we're seeing, though, is some of the larger farm operations that are purchasing multiple tractors from us are also adding on a battery, for example, like a single or multiple swappable batteries, so that when they have those high intensity duty cycles, they have the spare there to uh, to see them through the process. What's the recharge time look like for the batteries? Yeah, it's, it's about six to eight hours. Uh, it's level two charging, so it's quite reasonable. 
the way to think about it is most of the time the tractor is being used for a single shift and then charging for the evening. And if it's doing a double shift, you probably want some swappability. If you have a 14 hour battery and then it takes six to eight, eight hours to charge a swappable, you're not shutting down operations. And, and that makes a lot of sense. The farmer, you know, I'm farmer Grayson. I, I use my welding. I use my license doing stuff at night. Who knows what, but I'm doing stuff at night. But outside of the, the battery electric standpoint, how are your customers using the autonomous MKV tractor? I've seen Matheson Winery. They're using it in a winery. But in general, have you seen any trends of how your customers are using the tractors? Yeah. So we've kind of tried to actually create those trends with them. So we, we've obviously done a bunch of listening on what use cases they wanted to see unlocked first. And where we're at now is we mostly started by serving the winery industry. And so most of the farms that have our tractor today are wineries. And some of the most critical and time-consuming applications that they perform are mowing. And so this is one of the first things that we went ahead and automated. And, and I'll maybe back up for a second just to explain how one should think about automating a farm. So if you think about a winery, uh, it's you know, a couple hundred acres. There's a bunch of different blocks. These are you know, multi-acre rows of vines. And the tractor goes up and down those rows. And every time it goes up and down the row, you put a different what's called implement on the back. That implement could be a seeding implement. It could be a spraying implement, a mowing implement, tilling, et cetera. And between the you know, five to 10 major implements and a tractor, that's how 80% of the activity on a farm gets done. And so if you automate the tractor, you're then taking small incremental pieces of effort to automate each of those implements. And so we automated the tractor and now we started by automating mowing. And today, you know, there's many farms you can go to where our tractor will run for, you know, five, six, eight, 10 hours straight, just mowing. And so that's one of the first, you know, first applications that we focused on. And we've also expanded to do seeding. And then over time, we'll continue to add more and more implements that can run autonomous until we've really covered the full gamut of operations on the farm. There'll, there'll always be this long tail, you know, the last 20 percent of farm activity is go pick up that random bale over in the right corner. And, and you're not going to, it's never worth your your money to automate that away. And so we won't, but you really can, from our analysis and conversations with farmers, get yourself up to 75, 80% of, of operations on a typical farm, which is a really exciting thing to think about when you when you think about the you know freedom that provides to the, uh, the farm operator who's trying to plan a year's worth of operations. It's great for the farm, and I'll quote Willie Nelson, it's great for the family farmer. I mean, he's got farm aid to, to try and keep the farms there, and you're doing that. You're sitting here, you, you, you go to Mr. and Mrs. Farmer, you show up with your Monarch Autonomous Tractor, and say, okay, here, you give them the keys, here you go. No, how do you teach them how, how to use it, how to, how to plan? What does that process look like? Because I'm just assuming you just don't drop the keys off of the tractor and say, have fun, see you later. <laughs> you, would, you would be correct. We've actually spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about this. And I've, I've done autonomy a bunch of times before in my career. And, and this is always one of the things that you watch a lot of companies mess up. They don't realize how much effort it actually takes uh, to help your customer extract value from your product. Because it's not just autonomy. It's a change of the way that they do operations. And it's typically a change for the more complex, not for the simpler. But the value is... You know, they, they get a bunch of value out of it. And so the way that we typically do this at a you know, very abstracted level is we'll come in on day one and we'll map the farm. Our, our mapping is you know, quicker than, a, than some of the other uh, mapping that's existed in agriculture for the last 20 years. So listeners who, who are deep in the agriculture space, it's worth drawing a comparison. This is like a half day mapping exercise. You, you essentially drive around all the blocks so that the, the tractor can get its bearings. So that's kind of phase one. Phase two is we will actually run the autonomous operations with the farmer watching us. This is a chance for them to learn how you actually set up and deploy the tractor, how you pick a block, how you pick what row it'll start at, how you pick what row it'll end at, how you monitor it from the command center, how you interact with the tractor when, for example, it uh, sees an object that it doesn't know what to do with. But we handle the operation. After they've had a chance to see that a few times, we transition it to where they run the operation and we're right there besides them, watching them as they run it, helping them when they're hitting roadblocks. And then ultimately we're able to fall back off the farm into kind of like a tier three customer support role. This obviously takes weeks today, but we're trying to get it down to, you know, 
days or a week uh, in time. You have the customer success team that, that goes out there and sets them up. Absolutely. I, I think autonomy more than many industries can really pivot on how your customer success team operates, what they focus on, how much time you choose to have them give to the customer. I, I think this is, this is an industry where that's absolutely critical. When you do that, the most important thing you're doing, you're building trust with your customer. That, that's the key. When you have trust with your customer, you build a business. When you have trust with autonomy, we can scale as an industry. So, I'm okay, I'm Farmer Grayson here. I'm enjoying this. I'm going to have to get a farmer hat after this. And I'm, I'm out there on Grayson Farm, and you're long gone. I went through my customer success training. I got the customer success badge. I graduated. Good stuff here, <laughs> Sam. Is it the Wingspan AI app that I control my tractor? So you, you mentioned wine reason I like wine. So I can sit in there and pour myself a glass of wine or two or three as my tractor does what it does? <laughs> I, I would not recommend, but Wingspan AI is, is where you would interface uh, with the tractors. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I think, actually a point that sometimes slips by and people don't catch on to. If you automate a tractor and you have a dozen tractors or two dozen tractors running the farm, and then you connect those to a digital platform that essentially tracks everything from when they're dispatched to what they're doing to how well they're doing it, you've essentially digitized the farm. So we think about this digitization of a farm that Wingspan AI enables as really having you know, three major legs. So one, you're now doing all telematics for the management of your fleet. Two, all of your operations are recorded and reviewable so that you can start to make uh, decisions about how to potentially change them for the better. And then three, every time you run through the field, you're capturing a digital twin of your entire farm. And you run through the field 10 plus times a year. That's an incredibly rich data set that you can begin to analyze to improve how you're uh, growing your crops and ultimately improve the yield. So though each one of those, you know, we could crack open into a discussion, but that's the unlock from automating the farm and frankly, where almost as much, if not more value is created than autonomy. Absolutely. Are you also gathering weather data as, as well? Um, we do not. So we obviously could in time plug into uh, available weather data and utilize that to make decisions about scheduling. And we would probably look to do that. But at this point, we're you know, building out the core feature set, which is around being able to know when you're going to dispatch these tractors, when they're going to finish their run, how to notify the user back at command center when they're having issues. So some of the more core functions. Do you see this data becoming a new revenue stream for Monarch potentially down the line? I'm just thinking about you can basically sell an optimization guide to a farmer because you're knowing all this data. Absolutely. I, I think that this data set and, you know, if I kind of back up, it's not so much the single pieces of data that we're collecting from a particular farmer. It's really the structuring of the data and combination of the data, because it's very rare in agriculture that you know the where, when, how for everything. Because for our system, you have a camera capturing an image of the operation and the plant. You know when that happened. You know where it happened and you know what condition the tractor's in. And you know that across all farms. We then structure that, throw it up in the cloud, and that becomes an incredibly rich data set for one, the farmer to download and just analyze themselves. Two, for people to come in and actually create applications that farmers can utilize. Because farmers will say, tell you, don't, don't give me data. They, they've been in that game long enough. They've had a lot of people print out reels of data from them. And what they want is they want people to come in, figure out how to process that and give them actions they can take to improve their yield and make their farm more profitable. And the issue is there are lots of companies that have algorithms or processes, but they rarely are able to find a good enough structured database. And so we see ourselves as kind of plugging that gap. We're standardizing this data across all the farms, timestamping it, geostamping it, and then allowing people to write applications on that to give insights back to the farmer. I'm going to go back to your old world early in your career here for a moment because your previous company had a very big engagement with them. Did you basically building applied intuition for farms, but instead of having companies build it, developers are building it, and then you're getting a, a licensing fee for what they're building on your data? Yeah, there there is a little bit of that playing the central ecosystem role, uh, essentially the, the platform that people plug into. 
we, we do think that the hardest thing is collecting the data. And if you can collect that, people will flock to that platform and all the farmers will be better for it. It's really interesting. When, when I studied the design of your tractor, the cameras are, are up top and they were beautifully blended into the tractor. It didn't look like you didn't, you didn't go to, um, I don't know, Walmart and buy a bunch of cameras and, 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 and put them on. You actually built it in there. Did you have to just angle the cameras in a certain way to get the data that you're, you're trying to get? So on one aspect, you're trying to get the autonomy right. But on the other aspect, you've got this little business that's going to become a big business of data. So did you have to balance how you des- design the vehicle for that? Yes, yes. And I won't pretend to be the one who did this balance. You're now, you're now talking across <laughs> our, uh, our chief digital officer who, who's built up the autonomy stack, our industrial design team uh, that's thought about how to structure the, the roof. And, and really, it's funny, you, you mentioned the tilt. One of the big reasons for that tilt is to avoid sun glare. If you tilt the camera, if you can get the cameras high enough on the, on the vehicle to tilt it down, you minimize the amount of times that you're subjected to sun glare, uh, which allows you to minimize the amount of times you have to stop. That's why there's that small little roof over the cameras, and that's why they're angled down. Uh, and, and yes, there's also a, a consideration for what kind of crops do we go through? What height are they at? And are we making sure we're capturing the biggest portion of them that we can while still being able to drive uh, and complete the autonomous function? Uh, so yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. That's, that's the kind of optimization that you, you know, frankly, you get wrong a lot of times. And then eventually in version six, <laughs> you, en- you end up in the right place. Well, you ended up in the right place with the Mark V Foxconn's building. They started rolling off the line in April, the old Lordstown. I saw Lordstown pickup truck the other day. I was shocked. I had I did a triple take. I was like, wow, there, there's actually one in the wild. And now the, from what Steve Burns did with Lordstown to Monarch, they're doing, they're doing better stuff there now. How is Foxconn helping you scale? Obviously, they're manufacturing the tractor for you. They have a lot of component history, and they're really good at it. They build the iPhone, after all. So how are they helping the company scale? Yeah, no, they're a very important part of our story. So we knew from day one that the best use of our capital was throwing it into engineers who could design new electric and autonomous architectures. And so we knew from day one that we would, we were not going to manufacture our tractor. And, and I'll kind of you know give a bit of behind the scenes of how we did this. When we made the Mark V after we were done kind of testing validation builds and we were actually ready to go into production, we produced the first batch of these tractors, the first 50 in our facility here in Livermore, California. And we had Foxconn folks with us who were watching this happen and they're understanding the processes which we had optimized for how you assemble this thing in the most cost-effective manner. But that was really, we really built those first 50 ourselves purely to transition the knowledge of how to do so over to Foxconn, our contract manufacturer. And now they're able to do it at scale over in the Ohio facility. And, and this is really just a best of both worlds. They have, uh, as you mentioned, outstanding credentials in the space of manufacturing. Uh, and we have strong credentials in the development of the systems. And, and so we kind of do a handoff system where we help them understand the process. They then go and refine it. Uh, and then they're, they're manufacturing in their facilities on, on their dime. And uh, we get a product out the back that's high quality and able to go to our customers. So it's a beautiful marriage of, of contract manufacturer and Silicon Valley tech company, in my opinion. It's smart. You didn't do the stupid thing. You didn't, you didn't try and be everything to everybody. You said, okay, we're really good at building the software and the design of the vehicle. And you're good at building the business. Then you go to Foxconn, which builds world-class products that are used by millions of people around the world every day. Why did you and the founders make the smart decision of not trying to do what some of your peers in autonomy said, we're going to build everything in house because from a CapEx perspective, you just, I mean, you, you might as well light it up and smoke it and get high with Snoop Dogg at that point. You're just, you're just blowing it. So why did you make the right decision instead of going out there and, and getting stoned with Snoop Dogg? Yeah. So I, I think this goes back to having a, a seasoned team. So a lot of our team came from the auto industry and lived the last 10 years of new product development that happened in auto, where a lot of money got burned up uh, on electric and autonomy. Uh, as companies worked their way down the learning curve, handled all the issues. And so they saw that heartache and they knew that you're better off going to partner with someone for that activity. Uh, And I think it's one of those things, you know, it's not that we're any smarter than anyone else. I think it's just that we already learned our mistake through through previous work in the auto industry. We saw what that looked like. Uh, And so it was actually, I think, a a relatively clear decision, uh, an obvious decision when it came time to make it here. 
is it resonating with investors as well, the decision not to manufacture on your own? Yeah, I think as, as you know, any, any time you're, you're working with the venture community, asset light, capital being deployed to high return activities is front and center in their mind. This is a huge, crystal clear example uh, of us making a decision to that effect. And, and yes, it's one good appraise from investors for, uh, for the asset light nature that it provides. iPhones come in different sizes. Android phones come in different sizes. Will Monarch tractors at some point come in different sizes? Yes. If you dig into the, the tractor space, it, it's actually one of the most highly segmented markets I've ever been exposed to. There are tractors running from you know 20 horsepower or even lower, 15 horsepower, all the way up to 200, 600 on the, the huge combines. And each one of those has a geographic specification, crop type specification. And so you end up needing uh, more than one platform in order to serve all customers. As we think about it, we kind of sit at um, one of the more commonly used uh, platform sizes, the 40 horsepower narrow. It, it can serve a whole bunch of different uh, use cases in specialty crops. So that can be grapes, blueberries, orchards, citrus, turf, you name it. It can really play a role in those farms. But you sometimes need to go to a higher horsepower, like a 70 or 80, or down all the way to a 30 uh, for very tight spaces. And those are two sweet spots that we don't currently have a platform for that you could see us in the future uh, try to develop something around. If and when you do develop other platform sizes, will they be electric or will it just because of the, the mass size of the vehicle, will you have to develop a, a diesel tractor? It's a good question. So. When we developed our architecture, we kind of think of our system as having a electric architecture and an autonomous architecture. Both of them were built to scale. The electric really can go anywhere from 20 horsepower all the way up to 120. Uh, and you're right, at, at either end of that range, that architecture starts to break down. An alternate approach begins to become better. And so that's kind of the range that we expect to play in, but that's the fat part of the bell curve for agricultural equipment. Uh, and then on the autonomy side, that really has has no bounds. Uh, it, it can move from the very smallest to the very largest uh, tractor system. And, and so we'd expect to be leveraging 80, 90 percent of the, the work that the team has done over the last six years, uh, which is all you know by design. When you as you develop your autonomy stack, you develop your tractors, are there limitations to the farm application? So we have tillage, which is well known. You have harvesting. Are there any limitations or technical roadblocks that Monarch's going to have to overcome to expand into other parts of the, the farm operation? Yeah. I mean, look, every new implement that you choose to uh, manipulate and automate comes with a set of challenges. But the vast majority of them, uh, like, I, like I might have been saying earlier, like about 80% of those implements require small incremental developments to get going. Uh, relative to the core, tr the core tractor. Uh, I'll give like some examples of what doesn't. There's a whole space of agricultural robotics that is picking, picking strawberries, picking apples directly out of the tree, seeing them, going and grabbing them and putting them in a bucket. That's an example of an automation task that is beyond the scope of, of what something like the Mark V is looking to complete. Uh, there's a whole set of companies that are tackling that. It's a, it's, it's a very good use case, but it requires a whole new autonomy stack. Uh, and so it's somewhere where we won't expand to. Uh, but really, any of the instances where you see a tractor going down a row, it's got something behind it, it's in the dirt or above the dirt, those are the use cases where we, we have an opportunity to essentially help the farmer uh, reduce their costs. It's an extremely large market. It's, it's a profitable market, not just a profitable market for Monarch, but it's a profitable market for the farmer. The farmer is going to be able to increase their growing capability and be able to potentially expand the farm and get more acreage because of what you're enabling them to unlock. And this is the bottom line. I know I'm emphasizing this a lot, but autonomy is good for farmers. It's, it's good for the agriculture industry. Sam, in your opinion, what is the future of Monarch Tractor? I know you're just getting started, but the company's got a bright future. So what is that future in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think that future is ubiquitous autonomy. I, I think agriculture is at the beginning of a pretty big transition. It's enjoyed or it's enjoying about $100 billion worth of R&D that got pushed into the on-road autonomy market that we're now being able to reap the benefits of, apply into this limited operational design domain and make it work. And it's gonna take a long time to get it out into field. 
as everyone tackles all the different sub-markets of agriculture. But I think if you look at agriculture 10 years from now, uh, you're going to see a lot of Monarch tractors running around a lot of different farms uh, and a lot of farmers who are more profitable for it. And those farmers are happy farmers, and I'm going to be happy because I'm going to have a yummy tummy. Sam, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Yeah, um, I, I think, and it's really a revelation that I've had uh, recently, is just we sometimes take for granted how much goes in to make the food that we eat and how many people touch it, how much it costs to do that, how much you know sweat and tears goes into that work. And when you really dig into it, you realize that with rising populations, falling labor, all the things that we were talking about at, at the beginning, the, the mega trends, you need a lot of uh, changes or advancements or innovations to occur to keep the status quo. Most of us being able to get food regularly when we want it. And so I, I think it's a, it's a cool cause to keep a close eye on and watch. Uh, and I think there'll be a lot, of, a lot of fun companies that play in this space over the next couple of years. There'll be a lot of great companies that we just have to keep innovating. And for the the founders or investors, do not overlook the ag tech space. It is a booming space that's going to do good for your wallet. It's going to do good for the economy. And it's going to do good for society because we're going to put more food on more tables. That's healthier. The future is bright. The future is autonomous. The future is Monarch Tractor. Sam, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed listening, please kindly rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Road to Autonomy. Or email podcast at roadtoautonomy.com. The Road to Autonomy podcast is produced by the Road to Autonomy LLC. The views and opinions expressed in the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect those views of the Road to Autonomy, its subsidiaries, its shareholders, directors, investors, or partners. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, investment, tax, or business advice. Nothing is a recommendation that you purchase, sell, or hold any security or other investment or that you pursue any investment style or strategy. The content of this podcast is presented on an as-is basis with no warranties, express, or implied of any kind. Financial mentions about companies in the Road to Autonomy Index and discussions about the Road to Autonomy Indexes are for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon when making any investment decision. Furthermore, an inclusion of security within the Road to Autonomy Index is not a recommendation by the Road to Autonomy Indices, LLC, to buy, sell, or hold that such security, nor is it considered to be investment advice.